For Krima Media's policy, I'm Sane Damini. Joining me today is Makosa Zanakaba to discuss a book she co-authored with Atambile Masola titled Noni Jabavu, A Stranger at Home. So many viewers don't know anything about Noni Jabavu. Can you briefly tell us about her and why you decided to write a book about Noni Jabavu? Okay, when you say many viewers, of course, I was one of those people in 2001, when I first found her book at a secondhand bookstore in Melville. Now, as somebody who's been reading a lot, I was very shocked that I hadn't heard of her. So the book was drawn in color, African Contrasts, which was her first book that was published in 1960 in London by the John Murray Publishers. So I read the book and enjoyed it and it stayed next to my bed for the longest time because I kept dipping back into it. And I assumed that she had died. Big mistake. The following year, in 2001, I get an email from Tembe Gambobo, who at the time was running Women in Writing out of Soweto. The email was addressed to a number of us saying, Noni Jabavu is coming back home. And I remember being so shocked. I thought, why did I assume she had died? And mm. then the email continues to say, Virginia Peary, a writer from Harare, will be accompanying her. Could you help us track the family? She's coming back into the Eastern Cape, into a frail care center. And I am planning, she says in the email, to have us welcome her at the Oar Tambo Airport as the transit. That was fascinating for me. I thought, wow, how come... I hadn't heard of her when I'm such a reader. She's coming back home accompanied by a writer from Zimbabwe and Tembega is asking us to help track the family. What is all this about? Mm -hmm. But I didn't do anything at that time until I was doing my master's in creative writing. The first semester, uh, one of the um, essays we had to write was a biographical essay. And the homework, so to speak, <laughs> that we're given was to write the day in the life of. Mm -hmm. So we discussed biography in class and what that meant. And I thought, oh, let me return to the 5th of May, 2002, when Noni returned to South Africa. Mm -hmm. That's when the journey began. I went back, tried to Google her. There was nothing there. Asked people, there was, and I just got fascinated by the absence. And I kept thinking, what is this about? Who is she? Mm -hmm. So I wrote the essay, discussed it in class, which was the um, method that was used in class. And people just said, you need to write this biography, you know, because also in the room, people didn't know anything about her. So that's what started the journey of me being interested in her. And it's it's been a, a very long journey. But the end, the second year of the master's was then doing the actual research. And at that time, what I had found was uh, the fact that she had been an editor of the New Strand magazine in London in 1961 and 62, the fact that she had written columns for the Daily Dispatch, and then I wrote about the day she returned, because by now I could interview Virginia Peary, I could interview Lynette Elliott, the woman who ran the, the, the Frail Care Center, and so that's how the journey began. Mm. And uh, from reading the book, uh, she was also born in, into a well-known family, which, which was also politically connected. Tell us about her family briefly and how she moved to England uh, at the age of 13. So her mother comes from the Makiwane family. Her name was Florence. And people who do work around the histories of missionaries in South Africa are very mm -hmm. familiar with Elijah Makiwane. And that was the father to her mom. And Elijah Makiwane had Florence amongst the children. And he also had Cecilia. Cecilia Makiwane is very well known for having been the very first black woman to qualify as a professional nurse. Mm -hmm. And then the other sister was Daisy, Daisy Makiwane, who worked at the newspaper in Bozabansundu. 
and she took on many roles reporting and writing for for Imbozabansud. But she left uh, the Eastern Cape when she got married and came to, to Johannesburg. But the other thing that um, Daisy had done in her metric year, she had made history by becoming like the top student in mathematics and apparently there, were, there had been reports on her doing so well. Now, this is way back then. People are thinking <laughs> girls can't understand math. They're not smart enough. But mm -hmm. that's the mother side of the family there's there's a lot more i mean if you google the makiwan is a lot of other names come up but i was interested in 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 the women in the family because as a way of understanding noni it's it's already that already tells you here are successful people in your family on your mother's side her mother had gone to study in birmingham just before she got married to DDT and after Noni was born, she returned there. And then she did a lot of work helping women's empowerment in an organization called Zenzel. So on the father's side, the Jababus, her father is DDT. He became the first lecturer when Forte started. At that time, it was called the South African Native College in 1916. It was him and Alexandra Kerr. They were the first two lecturers at Fort Hare, And he taught there until his retirement. So a lot of people who later became very prominent leaders in, in the continent had come to Fort Hare to study. Mango Sutubutelezi, for instance, was mm -hmm. at Fort Hare. There's a very, very long list. But those are the connections. These are people who then knew DDT as my lecturer, you know, when I went there. So it's that history. And then DDT's dad was John Tengo Jabavu, who in 1884 started Imbo Zabansundu. Now, Imbo Zabansundu was a newspaper that was bilingual and it ran from 1884 until 19, I think 21, I could be wrong with when it ended, but that's a long time. And that's where Daisy worked, wrote for. And it was a newspaper that, you know, was, because it was based in the Eastern Cape, it was mostly about what was happening in the Eastern Cape, the politics, the this, the that, but it tried to cover quite a lot, focusing on, what black people's opinions and ideas were about. Mm -hmm. So that's a brief story of the history on both sides, which sets us up to understand her as somebody who's born into this family in a very small town at a university that is starting, but had made a lot of history because even the fundraising that had gone on in the late 1880s so that there could be this university had gone all over the continent. John Tango had done the work in the continent to make an argument for why we needed, they, well, we as Black South Africans needed to have our own university, so to speak. So she's born into the world. Imagine who's coming as, it's her home, right? But who's coming to talk to her mother? Who's coming to talk to her father? So she's a child, she goes to Lovedale, but she, she has the world at her doorstep. So when her parents decide to send her to a school, the idea was parents always want their children to get a better education, right? And that was part of the argument. Okay, we know that there's a girls' school at Mount York through the connections that they had. And at that time, girls' schools were very few. But going to Mount in, in the UK, the connection happened through the friends that the DDT had, which were Margaret Clark and Arthur Gillette. So that's who she left South Africa with, who were also connected to Jan Smuts, and they left from his home. And Margaret and, and, and Arthur had come back with their own children, and they left with no knee having joined them. So that's how she goes to the UK. So the parents live in Oxford and she goes to the north in New York for schooling until she finishes her education. And when she visited uh, 
South Africa in 1977, she was faced with the reality of apartheid uh, at customs. She was even questioned as to why a, for a black, black woman, she traveled so much. Tell us about that. He uses the word petty apartheid because in her in her head it's just like ah why are you being so petty that's not the most important thing. So this is about what South Africa was about at that time and the difference between a noni in 1977 who hasn't been living in South Africa and those of us who are living here. There's a way you learn to navigate a space. You know where you're not wanted. You know how to move around. But for her, it was just like such a shock. I mean, why does it matter? Why are you so surprised that I travel so much? Why are you so surprised that I have a, a British passport? What's wrong with you, you know? So those were the things that really irritated her, shocked her sometimes, and she got into trouble sometimes because she didn't quite understand that she couldn't meet with her friends at some hotel, who were, her friends who happened to be white at some hotel, you know? And the laws that it at that time did not let her stay in one place wherever she chose. She had to move between the various homelands. So that was the biggest um, confusion for her and shock and surprise that this was still happening, which isn't to say that she hadn't known about it. Of course she knew about it. And that's part of the reason she couldn't come to South Africa in the 1950s because she was married to a white person. So she knew about it, but to experience it, when you are staying in the country of your birth, you're visiting to do some work. So you're needing to connect to people. You're needing to travel. You need to find archives. You need to interview people. So the intensity of that experience, I think, results in that. And even her mentioning that, you know, what is this? Why do I feel like a stranger when I'm in my home? You know, she even struggled now uh, to adjust to how uh, Black South African men valued the women in the country. Tell us about that and about how she managed to adjust uh, around those issues. My sense of how she talks about it is the fact that the way men treat women, you know, mm -hmm. they feel like they can say anything to them. They can make comments. I mean, she was saying, what is this, you know? So some of it, of course, you and I will know. Men try to get your attention by giving you what they consider to be positive feedback, but yet they're just taking over your space. You know, they will even touch you without you having said anything to them because there's this thing that men believe in their heads as patriarchs that women belong to them. So that's what she she was having to deal with. And there was an expectation that she owed people responses. Mm. And she also addressed an, an important point for me at the time that many Black South Africans were not reading. In fact, in their houses, they had fewer books. Tell us about that. Be because she had come from this home that I was talking about, if your parents are in the education field, there will be books at home, right? So that's how she remembers her home, having a lot of books. But when she goes abroad and all the jobs she ended up taking on meant that there were books all over. There was a time when she worked for BBC Radio. She wasn't there full time. She came in and out over a number of years. To be involved in the various programs meant reading. So she was reading because she was used to it. She was reading because she enjoyed it. She was reading because it was part of her work. So when she ends up writing her own book, of course you read even more because your, your own book becomes now part of the broader community of books. Mm -hmm. So she took reading and books as a normal thing. She took it for granted. So when she visits people at their home, she's surprised. That's, you know, that's how I read how she talks about that because it was so, for her, it was so ingrained in who she was that people read and then she walks into homes and the absence of books says people aren't reading, which isn't to say they were not reading at all. I mean, books and newspapers are two different things. 
What lessons would you say now we as uh, South African women could learn from Noni Chabavu? I always find that kind of question very difficult because the lessons that you learn be are dependent on where you are, how you are positioned, where you come from, what you need in your life, what you're looking for. So depending on who you are, Maybe what you get from Noni Jababu is, oh, women travel all over the world and that's fine. Mm -hmm. Depending on who you are, maybe what you learn is, huh, it's okay to talk about your sexuality and, you know, your lovers and, you know, write about them. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on who you are. It depends on what you're interested in. It depends on where you want to go with your life. And I'm sure you, you've received a feedback from those who have read the book. What kind of feedback have you received? A lot of people are saying, oh, thank you for this. We didn't know about her. We knew about DDT, uh, but we've never heard of her. So there's that um, thank you we didn't know. But there's that, oh, this is who she is. What an interesting character, you know, for her time. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, is this what she did? How come we didn't know about what she did? Because sometimes you, for, at least for me, the connection was at two levels. I was interested in her life story. And then when I found out that she was writing, it was like, oh, so what are you writing about? How do you get to be an editor of a literary magazine in London? You know, And so how do you write your editorials? So when I first found the Daily Dispatch columns from the Joburg Library, that was what helped me even plan my further research journey towards her, her biography because she was talking about where she had lived, where she'd traveled to, you know, and I thought, huh, this is such a great basis for beginning to understand her life. That was Makosa Zanakaba speaking to Polity about a book titled Noni Jabavu, A Stranger at Home.